So welcome back to the um, uh, the most obscure part of the set of the of the retreat. <laughs> um, and the first thing that uh, we wanted to uh, announce was the uh, um, the opening or the beginning of a, of this uh, special issue on. Um, language variation meaning and change, language variation meaning and change, um, that will be under the language and computation umbrella, uh, which, uh, funny enough, is under artificial intelligence. The way this happened, this came about, is I was approached by the special, the editors for the Frontiers in Artificial Intelligence, and they say we would like, uh, uh, you know, we would like to, um, uh, recruit your efforts as associate editor uh, for a uh, for a volume that or a, I think they call it article collection that is at the forefront of connecting um, uh, language as it connects to cognition ultimately you know of course computation is underlying this is not necessarily computational linguistics it's about comp cognitive co cognitive computation of which language is a part um, and as I, that was happening, I was, uh, that was happening November last year, and uh, when I said uh, yes to that, the first thing that I saw was, oh, okay, so this is exactly the kind of uh, environment where, um, that, where we, we, we want to place uh, meaning in flux. So, um, this is sort of a general invitation to submit to this uh, issue. The issue is going to be actually co-edited by uh, myself, Petra Schumacher, and Ray Jackendorf. Um, and the theme is connecting language variation and language change, communicative environments, and individual differences. So here we want to cast a wide net. Um, and the reason we want to cast a wide net is because each one of us has very, you know, <coughs> starting from their own little corner. And the idea is for for the for the journal to uh, the, the journal um, format to be a space where people take a little bit of a risk, right? When people uh, you know feel uh, free to speculate a little more, uh, and the and the reviewers uh, the review editors are actually reflect the diversity that we expect. So we have. Um, and let me name it because this is the, the one recognition that they're going to get. That's it, nobody gets paid for this. So, Sergei Avruten at Utrecht, Oliver Bott at the University of Tübingen, Antonio Branco at Lisboa, Peter Kulikover at Ohio State, Catherine Franich at the University of Delaware, Ray Jackendorf, Yao Ying Lai at uh, National Rehabilitation in Japan, Bhuvana Anana Simhan at University of Colorado Boulder, Petra Schumacher, Jason Shaw at Yale, Mandy uh, Simon at uh, Carnegie Mellon, Anastasia Smirnova at San Francisco State, Kevin Tang at now at the University of Florida, Julie Van Dyke at Haskins Labs, Heike Visa at Humboldt University, and Eva Wittenberg at UC San Diego. Um, and these are just, this is uh, the, first, uh, the, the first set of uh, courageous individuals who agreed to participate at, uh, in this. And um, the invitation is open now to uh, all of you to submit. And that brings me to the, um, to actually what we uh, expect to be, to make of the, of the uh, inaugural paper for that, uh, for that uh, article collection. And the working title is One Role for Individual Differences. And the, and the, the uh, co-authors are the members of the Language and Brain Lab at Yale. And these are the people who, by now, whose faces you are familiar with. Um, the, um, and they are presented in a in reverse alphabetical order, because normally it's the other order. And so the Z's and the W's never get a chance. Uh, I learned this actually from Heike Visa. <laughs> she says, it's always the other way around. <laughs> so so, I, said, so I, I learned my lesson. I'm a P, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, that's, uh, so these are the people. 
And um, what we want to do in this uh, 45 minutes or so, and we we're, we're going to allow for some time for discussion, is to um, uh, present to you the intermediate stage, which we think is, is a good intermediate stage in a process that began about um, seven years ago or so, or probably more, uh, that has really led us to uh, think about individual differences as something that not only do we, that we have to take seriously because it's you know messing up our our, our results our, our data, but we have to take seriously because it's actually very interesting and informative of the phenomena that we are ultimately investigating. So that's what we want to unpack a little bit for to you for you today, um, and it's going to be in two parts. I'm going to be giving this introduction. Up to the up to the the key question, and then Andy is gonna take it from there and show you what we've done with the data that we've been collecting over these years, and then some conclusions. That's it, three parts. So in psychology, and this is our you know the, our, our our parent field as we see it, psychology slash cognitive science. What we are after is universal mechanisms. In linguistics, what we are after is universal grammar. So it's really about universality. It's really what, what brings us together. And in the process, what we now believe uh, is that we've kind of ex uh, exiled variation to noise and error term. Not that there haven't been voices saying, you have to pay attention to variation, but uh, particularly in the work that we've been doing in the lab and in a lot of the work that we've been paying attention to, variation is something that you consider and you put aside and say, yeah, but the mean is X, right? And, and then what uh, we are about to show you has really pushed us into the direction of what is this variability that we keep observing and cannot uh, fully uh, give shape to, uh, we're part of the signal. And so uh, that, what that would mean is reframing universality as a distribution of distributions. And of course, today, without planning for it, really, uh, that's what we've been seeing, right? That um, there is variation, and this variation is not trivial. And so uh, these are, uh, this is, uh, and this suggested the terms is like, well, so what we need to do is unpack the error term. Yes, that's what we need to do. But in the process, and this is what is making it um, interesting and uh, pause giving, is that we risk the possibility that uh, in the process, as we are trying to understand variability, the architecture that we normally presuppose for the whole system may be falsified. So that by understanding variability and really coming to terms with it, what we are really doing is shaking up the whole thing. And that, of course, we tread uh, with care and trepidation and uh, absolute, you know, 3 a.m. Uh, um, nightmares. <laughs> okay. So um, the so this is uh, for independent reasons. I've been unmarried to somebody who is into soils and farming and uh, cares about the earth and uh, the environment in a way that. Uh, makes me look cool. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've been learning from him, his name is Domingo Medina, is, is uh, the processes of root systems and how different they are and how they feed of the soil in specific ways and how the fungi and the fungi and the bacteria really are helping at the level of the root. And then I came across this picture which is a, uh, which I'll just picture is from the is called uh, the 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 source is understanding plant roots uh, from Jeff Schalau, I guess University of Arizona Cooperative Extension Yapabai County. So this is somebody who's really into just roots. He's not into cognition as far as I know. <laughs> but what um, this picture I find very um, illustrative of when I think of var variability of variation and I think of the cognitive systems that may be giving rise to it, then it's something like this, where you have, uh, so let me step so that I can point, so where you have, so we would call all of these root systems 
But as we can see, they are very different. And I can tell you they are very different, and the way in which they come, connect with the soil is quite distinct. Um, so it is as if what we've been focusing on is that okay, this is a root, this is a root, this is a root, this is a root, this is a root. And the shapes of these roots, the length of these roots, the thickness of these roots, all of these things, we've kind of put aside. Turns out that you cannot do that if what you want to do is grow food. You, don't, you can't do that, otherwise you will starve. And in a way, the, since what we want to do in the lab is understand what is it that we are, you know, to understand how meaning gets composed and, and embedded in a cognitive system, then that's the equivalent, that's become the equivalent for us for growing food. And then what, what if, when we talk about um, individual humans, what, you know, you would say, if you're looking at it from upstairs, what you're saying, this is just a bunch of plants, right? There are eight individuals here, and they're just a bunch of plants, and they all have roots. But when you look at here, below the surface, then what you see is an incredible and rich amount of variability, and you would be better served, which we now propose and, and fully embrace, um, that, you know, that we, that to understand it. So that's the memory. Whenever you think of individual differences, think of this. So um, what I want to, what I'm going to do now is go into a foray a little bit of how we came to this point. And in line with uh, what Jennifer did earlier this morning, I just want to go boom, 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 so that you get the narrative, the details we can always talk about, of course, but what you get the narrative of how we came to the point that uh, we come to today. So our starting point uh, is, 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 is an, an observation and work that uh, our colleague and former member of the lab, uh, uh, Ashwini Deo, uh, has done. Uh, she's an indo aryanist as well as a semanticist and, um, and a historical linguist. And her observation is the following, that in Marathi, an indo aryan language, uh, uh, there, are, there, are, there is a diachronic path for, uh, of, of the, in, uh, in the domain of location and possession. And what we uh, have done is to um, so try and see, well, if this location and possession path exists for one language, maybe in a language like English, which doesn't have this path exemplified in, in, in the given lexical item that I will talk about, uh, do, do we see any reflections of a connection between those two things? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then what, uh, what, you, what I will show you, this is like a little bit of a summary of what I'm going to do. What I will tell you is that we, at first, when we examine this further, uh, we found some systematic variability along gender baselines in terms of acceptability of certain kind of constructions with the lexical I can have. And that in the end they didn't work out. They were, we were we were proven we proved ourselves wrong fairly quickly after after we found this gender base. But once you start looking at gender and you find these individual differences that we could not go back. And then we had to as you, uh, as Jennifer said uh, do a deeper dive. And what we found um, it was this uh, this object, this construct of cognitive style which involves gender, but also involves this, this measurement called AQ. And this was in the context of Alan Hughes, we finding, you know, coming across Alan Hughes' uh, paper on the topic applied to, like, to uh, for, uh, sound change. And then what we have done since is uh, trying to understand AQ as a predictor of acceptability differences. And that's the case study. So, um, so let me tell you a little bit of the Marathi case. So in Marathi we have the postposition kade, and it has all of these meanings. It has a locative uh, inanimate, uh, locative animate, possessive alienable animate, possessive inalienable animate, possessive inalienable inanimate. And if this is too fast to parse and da da da, don't worry, we will get to the English side and then you'll see what this means really are about. But this is the progression. So at, at first, Kade entered the language uh, in the locative inanimate, locative animate domain. Um, the years pass, and then speakers, uh, and then and then 
possess, the other, the possession, the possessive ones use la as the as the lexical item. As the years pass, then uh, it is as if cade is begins to encroach in the space of la, and it starts uh, uh, being connectable to, pos in, to meaning possessive in an alienable animate. Uh, uh, so let me give you an example. Um, near the man is the broom. That's incidental location, so that would be locative animate, and then. It moves, so now Kade, that's what Kade means at the beginning, and then it moves to the man has a broom, where there is alienable possession already, in, in, in a sense of control. So the man has control over the broom. Um, and as time goes by, Kade continues to encroach, and then another lexical item, Jabal, uh, enters the language and begins to take the job of Kade. Uh, from um, that Kade had again from the locative inan inanimate uh, side, and the process continues. And these are stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, until Kade has pretty much conquered the whole space. Other lexical items are coming in, and La is on its way out. So that's Marathi Kade. And what I want to show you here is uh, the, the cognitive space that we think these meanings occupy. And the important thing, you, we, are not, we will not have time right now to talk about what connectedness or inextricability mean and the, on the y-axis we're going to have uh, control asymmetry. But the important thing is that you can see that all of, the, that the, um, that all of these meanings are connectable uh, from inalienable, uh, uh, coincidental location to possession where the, where the possessor has control over the entity to uh, back again to uh, inalienable possession like uh, part hole in particular so um, something like you know uh, Mary has a heart right where Mary is um, uh, you know she possesses a heart in a way, but she has really no control over it. And in fact, one could say that the heart controls her. Um, so, but they are maximally connected. So this is maximal connection or inextricability, minimal connection. And the other one is control asymmetry, which what it does, it goes from there is no asymmetry in who controls whom. That would be heart and Mary to high control asymmetry that would be in the man and the broom. And so what we see here is the, is the change, the shift over time. So this is Kade doing this work, right? Uh, uh, slowly but surely moving through this space uh, and other things taking its place when this, uh, this uh, express, uh, expressivity uh, or communicative possibilities uh, you know, it kind of abandons this space and moves over, and then uh, 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 Jival uh, kicks in and begins to take up that space. So um, the this is exactly the same thing, but what we are uh, showing here is that, you know that now we are summarizing it into the specific uh, the, the terms that I introduced at the beginning. So the locative the locative space animate and inanimate, the possessive space with uh, alienable animate, and then the possessive space um, with inalienable animate and inalienable inanimate. And this is the arc. So what about English have? So we've known forever that it uh, occupies, uh, that, that we, can com we can use have to name a bar a bar or to name parts, many parts of this space. We don't know whether anybody has talked about location possession as a space in the way that we are talking about, but certainly people have been aware, very good work, have been aware that all of this is a, is a, is a, um, is a, is a sh potentially shareable space. And we see them here using English Hub. So, uh, uh, John has a PlayStation, John has a sister, John has blue eyes, his table has four sturdy legs, the stadium has two pups flanking it, John has a cold, uh, John has a great deal of resilience. 
And in fact, the other thing that we know is that uh, there is no way in which we can talk about um, uh, have as having undergone this process of change or this process of acquisition of meaning. Uh, because if you, this is, comes from the OED, uh, the, you just like if you want to establish a synchronic, a diachronic pattern path, you, you cannot. All of them, you know, you, you get attested cases going back uh, uh, at least three centuries. So observation is one lexical item to many meanings. And then all meanings are available at the same time, no evident diachronic tra trajectory. But if what we are talking about is this uh, space, then um, so separate from that, there have been in the literature places, people have claimed that the locative meaning for have was as actually ungrammatical. Uh, that you could not uh, say something like, um, well, we are going to see what examples there, there are. And what I, we are expecting you're going to find is that like, uh, this is a your jarring. Yeah, these terms are, uh, these sentences are your jarring without a context. And that's exactly what we, what we are into. Um, but what, what I want to show you now is um, the, the specific study that we did that led us into the um, individual differences path. So we tested uh, English have in the location possession space with the expectation that have has a very salient preferred possessive meaning and that the locative meaning is really not uh, salient or um, preferred. And the question that we ask is, is locative meaning for have accessible to current English speakers? If the answer is no, then the OED is reported meanings no longer reflect the current meaning of, of have. If the answer is yes, a have is targeting a broader conceptual space than traditionally thought, which crucially can be characterized as continuous and parametrized by language independent cognitive parameters. And we are uh, cognitive factors, and we have tools that show that. So this is the data that we've been accumulating over the years, 271 native speakers. And this is the setup. And I'm, I'm placing the setup because ultimately when Andy talks about the larger data set that we are going to be manipulating, um, all of the setup for all of the studies regarding of language, we, uh, regarding of, of language, we, so we have uh, in English and um, uh, uh, Spanish and Mandarin. Um, the, the, pros, the, the setup is the same. We have a context, we have a target, and the question is, are the subjects, by whatever um, uh, dependent measure, able to retrieve the information from the context in order to improve their acceptability of the target or, the, or whatever behavioral measure we want. So we are putting all of the information in the context to bias towards a specific representation, a representation that is uh, this preferred, just like you can see that if I tell you the maple tree has a car, well, if I say to you that well, probably you'll be very forgiving and, 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 uh, and uh, condescending and say, oh, you're not a native speaker, that's why you said that. But <laughs> if I, uh, so, but if a non-native speaker would say it, then you would probably say, eh, it's a little off, right? And in fact, that's what we come up under it. Yes, you want to put under it. As as of put course, it, but we're not talking well, about the way it works. Yeah, but that's languages. what, yeah. That say. works all over the world in these languages. If they have you, you put a prepositional phrase with it, with has. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me continue and so, then you'll okay. see. Okay. Okay. So um, what we are after is whether the meaning of have has that possibility, just the meaning of have without the prepositional phrase. And because what we the, the claim would be, of course, you can always paraphrase. Paraphrase. You can you can always uh, grow and you can always further specify. But if only from having have you can access this space, then 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 we are talking about the coverage of have, um, uh, irrespective of other syntactic mechanisms that one can have. And so we went for the jugular here. We wanted to see if people's acceptability of a sentence like the maple tree has a car improves if you give it a locative meaning. If that, so like uh, the motorcycle is under the pine tree. And, uh, and of course, you know, and then the other three conditions are conditions that are controls for various things. Um, so, but, so here the key, the key measurement is the locative measurement. 
in comparison to the other ones, of course. And what we found was the following, that people did find it better. And I noticed it's not like so, they super liked, uh, super liked the, well, they didn't like these ones, but what they found is that whenever you have it, I mean, so they did like this, so this is 2.75 in a 1 to 5 uh, scale. So they didn't like it. They didn't like this one. They did not like this one at all. And, but if you give it a locative meaning, then they can use have to say, yeah, the sentence improves. Uh, it's better. So it's not that it improves, it's better. What we are saying is that it improves because we gave them a specific context. And this is the other thing that we found, which is that the women's behavior, the females' behavior, were driving uh, the effect. So when uh, women were showing greater sensitivity to the to the context than men were in the in in, in this. But what I want to do, and this is, a, 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 we went through several kinds of animation to show that this is actually not true. This is the one we settled on. It's not true. It's not true that this is about women or men. This is not a gender thing. Um, so what we found, uh, so, but then the, the question remains, you know, so, so we did still, and this is the situation that I was explaining before, we still found the context of a, uh, an individual difference uh, uh, um, uh, in effect uh, that at the time we thought it was gender and we could not think of obvious, uh, no, well, there were obvious or not obvious, but the literature already suggested women in context sensitivity, etc. But this was a, a kind of a phenomenon that we thought was extremely culture independent. Mm -hmm. That this, you know, that the kind of thing, that the, the kind of um, uh, context, uh, con cognitive space that this is accessing is not one that we would expect cultural forces to be you know, uh, kind of manipulating, massaging. We, that's what we thought at the time. So um, that's when we came across uh, Alan's, uh, Alan's papers, and uh, which were crucial for us because it, because it was the application into language and to language change. I remember that was the, this is where we were coming from, the diachrony, uh, diachrony uh, synchrony connection. And since then, as you see here in the references, a lot of people have done uh, work uh, using this specific tool, the Autism Quotient, or AQ. Um, and lo and behold, when we actually measure the uh, Autism Quotient of, of uh, uh, we continue uh, doing data acquisition, and now we introduce this measurement, what we found was a significant difference in the, uh, the, the, the significant correlation, such that as you were going up in the AQ uh, scale, that is, you, you were showing more and more autistic traits, even though you were not autistic, uh, diagnosed as autistic, your, uh, the likelihood of your acceptability, that, that you would accept this sentence, that you would uh, uh, re respond to the context, was uh, decreased. So that was uh, great. Because what is the what is the the correlation coefficient there? I mean, it's a tiny correlation. Yeah. Uh, it's small. Three. It's small. It's small. Yeah. yeah. But it's significant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, 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 it's significant at one level. We want to know size, not significance. Exactly. We can get more into that. He's going to have to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, but yeah. size is still yeah, yeah, for sure. small. Listen, <laughs> this is the thing. If you can tell me a, a gender story, and then we would. No, we, I'm not if, have that's a right. Exactly. So then we <laughs> find this, yeah. and it's tiny, but it's giving, it's, it's pointing us into that direction. So that's what I want to point out right now. So what, tell me what's the mean acceptability rating of what is of the locative K line? Yes. It's just the first bar. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The others don't correlate at all with but this measure. But it could be you did, do the subtraction, so it's a, a one minus four, let's say. It's the difference. That'll come up later. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Also, because this is only uh, this is 270, no, 271. 271 subjects. And uh, what you will see is that you need a lot more subjects in order to really begin to see what's going on. Um, 
So, um, but we appreciate the skepticism. <laughs> uh, so, these are the ingredients then that we are observing. So, we have higher ratings, uh, higher ratings when context that support, context support the intended interpretation. And what we see is that if your IQ is lower, uh, you are um, you are also uh, deemed uh, pragmatically aware. Possibly, that is uh, Alan Liu's term. And that if you're a low IQ participant, you show higher uh, acceptability ratings for contextually demanding expressions. That's also what we find. And so that leads to the hypothesis. Low IQ manifests as individuals, increased communicational competence due to increased sensitivity to context. So now we have the term context sensitivity. So if the quality of being low IQ contains in it, uh, so, uh, if, so what we want to know is of whether the quality, what in the quality of uh, low IQ contains what what of context sensitivity is involved in the quality of being low IQ? Because remember, IQ is a metric, is a test. With uh, as you will see now, 50 items, blah blah blah. So what we want to know is, in, and and as you will also learn, this was not developed to do the, this kind of thing. This was borrowed. <laughs> And what we want to understand is what is, in the, what is this test picking out such that it, it's giving us this, um, this uh, possibility of uh, these patterns. So what does, cognitive, what, what does being context sensitive mean? Well, here's another question related to this, which is why on earth think of thinking of the AQ measuring context sensitivity. So what does it mean? But also, what is the evidence that that's what AQ is measuring? Oh, so that's actually different. Yes, that's no, they are two different questions. Yeah, they are two different questions, but the mm -hmm. that one is uh, one that we because what you're asking, I you know, what I'm understanding is that we are asking independently is what is AQ? What is uh, what is autism? Such that this AQ test can can pick it up because mm -hmm. that was what is it's a diagnostic tool. Yeah. The AQ test is a diagnostic. Tool. So the what I am what. At the time, and this is also interesting, what we are taking from this is that we know two things about, uh, from, about AQ, uh, about autistic uh, subjects or subjects with autism. One is that uh, they have language problems, and two, that they, they have issues with context sensitivity, widely construed. So that's what we are, that, you know, this is really like we are in the dark and we are getting this threat and we but are walking with but it. But there are certainly other fundamental problems with, with uh, autistic people that aren't that, that are also measured in AQ. Right? Exactly. Yes. And so the que we know that and the question is how do we extract the stuff that is connected to the effects that we are finding? Mm -hmm. Take it away. We'll, we'll, we'll see some more. Okay, so just to recap from you know the previous slide, you need that. So low IQ is is somehow indicating this increased context sensitivity, and we're we're using this term is hypothesis. correlated with. Uh, yeah, yeah, is is correlating in in uh, in our models um, what we are attributing to something like increased context sensitivity. So we talk about context sensitivity, and a lot of people talk about context sensitivity, uh, but it's really important for us to understand what exactly we mean and and what are the what are the things that people are doing when they're context sensitive. What are the traits that we can ascribe to them? And so uh, to begin, I think we can start with these two levels, and this uh, this. Pre previewed yesterday. So, first, we we need to if we're if we're a context sensitive uh, comprehender or speaker, we need to have knowledge that context is informative, and we have to be able to uh, identify that relevant knowledge. But we also need to uh, determine when that knowledge is useful. So it's not just a kind of a, a lower level detection of possible cues in the context, but we have to calibrate the relevance of different types of information. Because context is large, right? Uh, the definition of context already is an, is an important uh, question for downstream processing. So what, what counts as being in the context? Um, and, and what of the things that count as being in the context are reliable uh, cues to something that I'm going to need to do? And so the question is, do, you know, which of these does AQ predict statistically? 
and uh, if it does that at all, or if it's something else, right? And so th this is the question uh, that specifically we're trying to address in, in this study. So let's uh, let's go back to the AQ. You know, since we've we've mentioned it a lot. Um, so uh, the question again that we're asking is, what is AQ telling us? Um, and to do that, we have to go to the background. What was it designed to do? So it was designed uh, as, as this instrument for rapidly quantifying where any given individual is situated on the continuum from autism to normality. And this is a quote from the original paper, right? And so the structure is these 50 items. They're all I statements. Um, and you just indicate uh, which of these you agree with. So do you definitely agree, slightly agree, slightly disagree, or definitely disagree? And there are five subscales, so 10 items each, uh, belonging to these, uh, these subscales named social skill, attention switching, attention to detail, communication, and imagination. And these are motivated from uh, clinical work on, uh, on autism of the major dimensions of autistic deficit. And so, you know, the question is, are these underlying operationalizations actually uh, equally contributing to you know this generalized AQ, and uh, a kind of a bigger question is wh what is social skill identifying uh, in in cognitive operation, right? So what what specifically is social skill? And we'll take a look at these subskills a little bit more deeply um, to get a better understanding. No, it's matter to say context sensitive. Right, right. So we have exactly. these five subscales. Here they are again, and uh, this is the question that we are going to ask. And so here's some of them. So this is AQ uh, item number 36, which belongs to social skill. So the statement is, I find it easy to work out what someone is thinking or feeling just by looking at their face. This one's an attention switching question. In a social group, I can easily keep track of several people's uh, conversations. Here's an attention to detail one. I'm fascinated by dates. Uh, communication. Other people frequently tell me that what I've said isn't polite, even though I think it is polite. Oh, uh, here's another communication. I find it easy to read between the lines when someone is talking to me. And when I'm reading a story, I find it difficult to work out the character's intentions. So one thing we can, uh, so the, the items, some of them are reverse scale. I think, yeah, some of these you would answer, like definitely agree or definitely disagree, depending on uh, the items, and they're balanced in that way. Uh, so one thing, that you know is, is quite striking when you look at these items is they don't seem to fall clearly along these five dimensions. So something like, uh, you know, I find it easy to read between the lines when someone is talking to me seems to invoke other subscales like potentially social skill, right, of being able to read these, these social interactions. And so this is something that will, this, this uh, skepticism will carry through. And so uh, the way that it's scoring, so clinically it's used uh, in a binary scoring, so 0 to 50. And again, this tool is used as like a really quick diagnostic. Can we administer this, this six-minute paper survey instead of the, you know, the 30-hour ADOS 2 or something? And what they find is that the 35, oh, there should be an end quote, of course. Uh, 35 is this threshold where it's like, if you have, if you score above 35, um, you have like it's like a ninety five percent chance of getting uh, an autistic diagnosis, and inversely, uh, if you score below, you have a ninety five percent chance of not. So it's not um, like this absolute measure of diagnosis, but it'll be uh, useful in evaluating whether or not we should spend you know the, the two days necessary to to evaluate this uh, this uh, subject. And so. Uh, binary scoring is saying uh, is collapsing the completely or the definitely and the slightly. So if you pick definitely agree or slightly agree, that counts as one, and the other one is zero. Uh, so the other way that people have scored this is is with a Likert scale. So one, two, three, four. And uh, just to note, the binary thirty-five uh, could give a wide range in the in the Likert scaling, right? So so we get this valence difference as well. And so. AQ is really reliable in two correlations. One is that uh, men score higher than women, 
And the other one is that STEM people score uh, higher than non-STEM people. <laughs> I'm not going to make much of this, but this, but, but this is um, this is the evidence uh, for that the that people who have designed the AQ and who have worked with it are like, oh, this is really reliable. We can always tease apart these two populations. And I'll show you some uh, data, um, some bigger data from other people that that follow this. What was it not designed to do? So it's not necessarily a psychometric for cognitive function. And this is a really important thing for us to understand. And in fact, the authors say its potential for screening autism spectrum conditions in adults of normal intelligence remains to be fully explored. So this is kind of our, our warning sign of like we can't take this measure wholesale and apply it to all sorts of cognitive tasks that we might think it uh, is useful for, even if we have these strong statistical correlations or weak statistical correlations. And so. Uh, when we look at the literature, we're, we're also not clear on what the, the conclusions about AQ are. So different, uh, you know, different people have used different subscales, and they, they draw somewhat different conclusions from it. So that, I think this is going to address your question. So here again, I'm going to list those. Those are the five subscales. So one of the first papers uh, was this uh, cognition paper, where they found that uh, they used the AQ with a liquid scale, and they found that it um, it correlated with contextual information integration. And specifically, this task was the, I think it's called the Ganong effect, where if you have lexical, uh, knowledge about lexical uh, items, that can inform uh, how you perceive an ambiguous stimulus in terms of phonetic um, uh, discrimination. So more uh, low AQ, so more uh, context sensitive people, uh, were more influenced by lexical knowledge. Um, so this one was a similar study, and, and they said that uh, the AQ measure is, uh, is something like multi-sensory integration. So this one was an air puff study, so this, in, in this paradigm you hear an ambiguous um, uh, segment, and in the case of testing like aspiration, you can get an air puff like either here, on your wrist, or on your ankle. And the presence of that air puff can uh, sway your decision, depending on who you are. So uh, again, the low AQ, the more context sensitive, were more affected by this multi-sensory um, uh, input in their discrimination task. Okay. So here we go to, to use studies. And so he uses three of these subscales. The, the full AQ, the attention switching one, and the communication. And those two he residualized for social skill, noting that a lot of these subscales are highly correlated with each other. And um, the conclusion that he draws is that uh, AQ is, is correlated with something like awareness of contextual variation. Can you detect variation in the context? Um, another study uh, used binary, but just for the, the communication subscale, so those 10 communication questions, and they, they binned it into a low and high, and they found that uh, low AQ, and they say, uh, f uh, had few pragmatic language difficulties. And another study with the same measure said something about like pragmatic reasoning. So over this is where we get the hints towards something like context sensitivity. It has to do with, with awareness or use of context. So this is, I think, uh, addressing your question. Uh, it doesn't seem to be something like, uh, like a social communicative uh, deficit, which is one of the big um, components of autism. And so when we look at the internal structure, um, all the factor analyses that have been done with the AQ have undermined this five-factor structure. So the first one was, uh, was this paper, and they have 300 uh, undergrads and adults, and they find a three-factor solution that correlated pretty well with those existing subscales. So there's something about social skill, something about attention switching, and then this communication. Um, this one is a bit bigger study, and they support this three-factor solution. Attention to detail. Attention to detail. Yeah. You said they just speak. Oh, attention to detail. Sorry, that's AD. The same three factors? Same, uh, yeah, so, uh, roughly. They, uh, I think they call it uh, something a little bit different, but it's roughly uh, similar items. And uh, this one uh, was conducted in Holland. So the, the AQ actually does really well cross-culturally and cross-linguistically. Um, and there are all sorts of versions in different languages. And so this one finds more of a two-factor um, solution where attention to detail um, is, is quite, quite reliable as its own item, but all the other sub subscales, so social skill, attention switching, communication, imagination, all seem to pattern together. 
Um, I think this is the more conservative interpretation of the three-factor solution. Because in that, uh, the, the distinction between social skill and communication items is less clear. Except for if the factor analysis says that they're different factors, you can't say they're the same. You, uh, that's true, but the way that you are um, identifying in your, in your factor selection how many factors you want to consider uh, can depend on, you know, the, the, if you look at your screw plot, if you use eigenvalue thresholds, um, it's, it's still, there's still some researcher um, interpretation that's needed. Because uh, they have to justify three versus fifty factors, or two versus fifty factors, mm -hmm. and, and so this and is there's the, always researcher freedom in labeling what the factors exactly, are. exactly, and that's uh, we'll get very much into that for sure. So this is the largest study that's been done to date on HQ, and it's basically a replication of the two thousand, the original two thousand one paper. Um, Simon Barakot is the is the PI on this, and so they find the, the you know their their favorite correlations that across five hundred thousand adults uh, in the UK, there's the strong uh, males score higher than females and STEM occupations score uh, higher on the AQ than non-STEM occupations. So uh, we some want to scales. Sorry? Yeah. They don't so so again uh, their purpose is not to identify these like five different cognitive components associated with, with autism deficit or three or whatever. They they don't actually talk about the behavior of the subscales at all. They just they say the fifty questions are good at doing what these fifty questions do. And so uh, some methodological notes that we want to compare to the actual like gold standard in autism diagnosis, which is this ABOS2. I think this is the most recent version. And this is a, it's like a two-day um, of clinical evaluation. There are lots of uh, psychologists and psychiatrists that are involved, lots of different tests. And it takes quite a bit of effort. There's, there's like a team meeting on day two uh, that, that reviews some of the, of the footage on day one, too. So it's quite involved. But two things. So in terms of reflection, the ADOS2 is, is this external like evaluation by a trained psychiatrist, whereas AQ, we have this self-interpretation. And that's something we'll, we'll probably mention. Uh, probably mention uh, because there seems to be some a degree of self-evaluation freedom in, in these items. And the other thing is that relevant to what we're thinking about, which is context, in the ADOS too, you're provided with all these situations, like there are these games that you do, these simulated social environments that give you these contexts where you can uh, kind of like assess the uh, the ability or the you know, the behavior of the, of the participant in question. Whereas for AQ, you have to self-generate all these examples. So when they say something, when, when the item is like, you know, uh, in a social situation, I can keep track of many people's uh, conversations at the same time. And you have to agree, you know, if you, if you do that or not, you have to come up with all these, these examples of like, okay, in this social situation, what, what did I do? In this social situation, what did I do? So there's a lot of like, context generation that you have to do uh, for something like um, I'm fascinated by dates. You have to think of like, oh, do, do I know about dates? You know, do I like dates? What are dates that I can remember? Things like that. Okay, that's my, that's my point. Um, okay, so now we have the, enough data to really under, to try to understand this and a better understanding of possible components of context sensitivity. And the goal here is to break down this AQ and understand its components. And so we're going to have two parallel approaches. One is this conceptual deep dive. And this is uh, us creating a subscale uh, with items that we think behave together and are indexing you know, whatever uh, traits we think are involved in these tasks. And the other one is a data-driven dimension reduction. So we're doing exploratory and confirmatory fact analysis. And what we're going to do is correlate uh, you know, our uh, subscale and the results of the factor analysis with context modulation data. And so uh, this is our subscale. We call it awareness of communicative intent. That term should be familiar. I, I did mention it yesterday. And the, the goal was to say which items best connect to our working hypothesis of a competent speaker here. And so this is an individual who, A, has that knowledge, that context uh, has useful information in it, and also can uh, calibrate such information in, uh, in the relevant way for that context. And so uh, over the course of 
many, many discussions, we picked out 13 of these items that we felt met uh, these criteria, and these form the subscale. So I'm, these are the questions. I'm going to skip by. We can talk about it if you're interested in it, uh, later. And so in terms of factor analysis, we did exploratory factor analysis. And the items were selected uh, you know, on these criteria. We made our cut at four factors. And we did a confirmatory factor analysis. There are lots of details that we don't have time to talk about now, but we can talk about later. And so the four-factor solution, the first one, uh, we're calling calibration of structure resolution. And this is a, a total mouthful, so let me, uh, let me, let me uh, uh, explain it. So um, here are two, um, uh, two sample items from this. Um, so I tend to notice details that others do not, and I notice patterns and things all the time. So this is getting at that second part of context sensitivity that I mentioned, of not just knowing uh, when something is useful in the context, but being able to calibrate when, um, when the right level of information is going to be relevant at, uh, for whatever task. So this is, why, this is why we have the calibration. So this is kind of up down um, of, of the resolution of your structure. Um, that term, the, you know, these are all kind of working names for our labels, but this is what we're going to call this one for now. Let me move on. Um, our second one is called self-perceived social capacity, and this one is more, uh, it's kind of like a sense of uh, gregariousness. Do you like to be around people? Things like, I find myself drawn more strongly to people than things, or I enjoy social occasions. Our third one actually was seven items from our kind of a priori 13 item subscale. So all of these sub seven items uh, were, were ones that we had selected in our scale. And so it was nice to see that the scale that we identified a priori shows up as a coherent factor in this analysis. And so things like when I talk on the phone, I'm not sure when it's my turn to speak, or I'm often the last to understand the point of the joke. And the last one we're calling roughly theory of mind. Um, these are two of those five items. I find it easy to work out what someone is thinking or feeling just by looking at their face, or uh, I find it very easy to play games with children that involve pretending. Uh, so again, these, the names of the factors are, are not quite as important at this point, because as you were mentioning, this is very much uh, a researcher determined. These are the four items, and I'm going to skip them, and let's go to the data. So we have 10 studies, and it spans a range of methodologies, uh, quite a few languages, and we have about 1,100 participants in total. So the data that I'm going to show you today is, is from uh, about 800 of them. We're still working on you know, uh, integrating uh, the, the other uh, data into this study. So all the, um, all the studies have this structure, where there's a supporting context and a neutral context and an ambiguous target. Uh, the linguistic construction differs, the language differs, um, the way that this is asked of the subject can differ, but this is the essential structure for all of these studies. And so the dependent variable, um, conceptually, is the measure of the target after the supportive context and the measure of the target after the neutral context. And this is identif identifying something like con uh, contextual facilitation. Were you helped by the supportive context? Um, and so this was always a minimal pair in the condition structure. So if you remember the study earlier, there were like four conditions. So it's the, the supportive one minus the neutral one. And this was matched always in, uh, in each item. And so we're exploring some other ways to compute this dependent variable, but this is what we have right now. And then we uh, calculate subject means across all items within each study, and then z-score all those subject means because uh, self-paced reading times and, uh, and EEG measure, uh, microvolt uh, deflections uh, don't always match numerically. Right? <laughs> so now we're in the same. Now we're in the same space. And so, how do the four factors predict variability in this dependent variable? Uh, so again, our dependent variable is that context, that measure of were you helped by the context. If you were, then you're going to have a difference, uh, which is I think what you were saying between the the helpful context and the not helpful context. If you are not affected by it, you you won't have a difference. Right. So here we're exactly working with that. And so um, I'm going to show you five plots. The dependent variable on the, on the y-axis is always going to be the same. And on the x-axis, we're going to look at the full AQ and then the four, uh, the four subscales that emerge in the factor analysis. So here's the full AQ. Is this your AQ 
with your items or the full eight? This, this is the, the this one is the full eight. That's what we already saw. So with, with like 1,000 items. No, 50. 50. 50. No, 50. 50. 50 items. Yeah, just the, the full 50. Yeah. It's, it's not that it, it takes 40 six minutes. minutes. Yeah. So this is what we saw before. Right. Uh, well, uh, is, this is 850 is. subjects mm -hmm. um, across, I think, seven or eight studies in, in uh, different languages transformed to this z-score space, right? And we find this significant correlation. Again, this is a very small correlation, right? Um, but it's saying uh, that this one's not surprising because we were, uh, we did find this in a lot of the component uh, studies, right? So grouping the subjects together, we should find the, the same data structure, right? And so here's our factor one. And so this is a smaller number because the, you know, the, it's only seven items. And we find that factor one is significantly correlated with the dependent variable in the studies. So that's the calibration of structure resolution one. Factor two, however, is not uh, at all. This is the, uh, the gregariousness one. I like, to, I like to be in a social setting, something like that. Um, awareness of communicative intent did correlate significantly, and theory of mind did not. Gosh. So, what we're seeing is that although AQ is, you know, AQ is this broad general measure, and the 50 item sum, uh, sum AQ is not, is not fine-grained enough, is, and it's not conceptually ground enough for testing uh, the constructs that we're trying to test, right? And, you know, that's not its fault per se. It, it was made for something else. It was made for this kind of rule of thumb, you know, a heuristic a, uh, autism spectrum uh, condition diagnosis. So if we want to use it for the things that we want to use it for, we want to adapt it. And so our factor analysis shows that two of the four factors that emerged uh, do uh, correlate a little bit, although significantly, with the dependent variable in the data that's been abstracted away from all these different studies. Right? And so this is supporting our two-level construct of context sensitivity, which is that there's something to do with knowledge or recognition of relevant information in the context, but also of being able to uh, calibrate and use dynamically the right type of information in the right place. And so, actually the best model, we can talk about this later, but the best model has both of these things. So, they're not explaining exactly the same level of variation. So, are those two together? How are they related to your opera? Did you do your operatory one before you did these, this factor analysis? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's pretty astonishing. And what's the relation between the unit, the the items in, so the awareness of communicative intent must have been already in your third. Yeah, so this one was seven items, and so the factor enough, the, the, the confirmatory one said, look, these seven items are good, and all of them were present in our original 13. Yeah. The calibration of structure resolution one um, were, was totally different. So and none of those you were. Did, you did not think, I am very good at attending to detail, would be one of the ones right. that. That is not, so that. That was actually a surprising finding. We we had hoped and expected to find something like this, yeah. um, but but that one was uh, that one was new. Um, and so, what were the six that were in your thirteen? Where so they so the let's let's just finish up and then and then we can talk about the specific items. I have I have them all on later slides. Yeah. So you can okay. So these are the conclusions, so that we can discuss. Um, so the, this AQ test is a broad general measure that includes components of communication that involves context sensitivity. Uh, the uh, test does not give us only context sensitivity, even at the level of the subscales. We are unable to isolate any one subscale that exclusively captures it, whatever that is. Instead, the measurements of for context sensitivity appear at least at first to be distributed across all subscales. And this means that this meant to us that we needed to adapt the tool. How did we do that? We took two approaches, one conceptual and one data driven. The conceptual one was to figure out which items best connect to our working hypothesis of a competent speaker hearer. What do we mean by a competent speaker hearer? An individual who A, has knowledge that context possesses information, and B, has the ability to calibrate such information in any context presented. 
Interestingly, by the way, uh, for those of you who were here for Martin's uh, talk on uh, Thursday, um, this is a part of, you know, the, these ideas uh, were coming from that and our, our understanding of what perspective alignment uh, meant, if that rings any bells. Um, so this is something that we've been trying to at, uh, attack or approach from a variety of, uh, of phenomena and given a variety of challenges that those phenomena presented to us from the perspective of, of uh, comprehension. And, and it just turns out that this is exactly what, um, uh, what is emerging. So 13 out of the 50 items met the above criteria, and as Andy just said, they were targeting um, most clearly awareness of communicative intent. That was what we were after. Then we did a data-driven uh, approach to explore the factor structure of the full AQ test and compare that to the factor structure, to, uh, that factor structure to the ACI, the awareness of communicative intent. And the results from our factor analysis revealed the two components one that matches the ACI, and another one, which we now term calibration of structure resolution, which we, which, you know, we are presenting it to you, we are calling it this, for lack of a better term. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it's kind of intriguing and, um, and interesting to think about that, uh, also in the context of, of other stuff that we've been doing, having to do with metonymy, is the idea that, you know, when we think of high AQ and low AQ, to say, oh, you know, high AQ bad, low AQ good. And, uh, and we really think that that's the wrong way to think about any of this stuff, because there are um, uh, communicative uh, obstacles that present at both, at both ends. So if you are too, um, too goal-oriented, let's call it, then you're going to miss out and completely and end up maybe barking at the wrong tree. If you are too context-aware, uh, you're going to be paralyzed because you're getting all kinds of information all the time and you, if you don't have a way of calibrating this, of deciding what, what's what, what is necessary at any given time, then you're going to also run into trouble. So um, the, all of this understanding, what is bringing us is that what, what we are a competent speaker here is somebody who is, who is in the middle of this. And, um, and of course we fail and, and uh, succeed at various times uh, it, it goes very nicely with the findings presented to us this morning about calibrating to the individual. So I hear you and I have to get enough data so that I can put you in a specific uh, space. Um, it all begins to kind of make sense in a, in, a, in a very satisfying way. We propose that these two components represent the best indicators of linguistic context sensitivity that can be extracted from the AQ test. Um, and what we hope uh, that, that this represents the, 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 a contribution for, uh, from us to the field in the sense that, um, that this is a protocol that we are saying, you know, try it out and see if it works for you. One of the things that we do warn you is that all of this data we acquired, or I mean, these two components were embedded in the, whole, in, the in the application of the whole test, which means that we would we would probably not want to just take out that 13 items uh, because there may be context effects that come from having presented the whole thing and, uh, and so we, we may miss out. So that's something that has to do with validation of these uh, 13 items. So what we continue to do uh, for everything we do is just, we just, it takes about 10 minutes or so to give the questionnaire to the subjects and that's it and we keep on um, gathering, gathering this data but now we have narrower, more focused uh, um, deliberate um, object. Can I ask you a question about the data? That's it, it's over. Uh -oh. <laughs>